and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, as before, um, oh, including Sandy, we met Sandy in the street, uh, Bishop Tim and I and Susan when we were walking along. Sandy was out with the dog and we said, um, are you coming? You couldn't really say no, could you? And here you are. <laughs> <laughs> dog I know was braver than you were. How lovely you're here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, people from uh, this parish and from, um, from all over. It's lovely to see you all. Um, welcome, of course, to Bishop Tim Stevens. Um, Nigel uh, knew Tim a very long time ago. Uh, Tim trained Nigel in part, didn't you? In Chelmsford Diocese, yes. Um, I met Tim for the first time um, when uh, we were both in Suffolk. Uh, Bishop Tim was uh, Bishop of Dunwich, um, the end of the 90s, weren't you? Um, and I met him a couple of times then. Uh, he later became Bishop of Leicester, um, and then a few years ago I went on a course that Ruth Denigan, um, our lay reader who was here, um, she put on a course and I saw that uh, not only was it on the kingdom, um, the speaker was Bishop Tim Stevens, and I remembered um, how fabulous um, he was, and um, he was just as fabulous um, all those years later. Um, and has become a, a huge inspiration um, to me and Hal. He's heard so many things about Soham um, and how much um, I love this town. Um, I was trying to find uh, an excuse that, you know, wasn't just, you'd be great, please could you come, um, to get him to do something. Um, bishop Tim, when he was Bishop of Leicester for a time, uh, was the chair of the bishops in the House of Lords. Um, and I can't think of a better person um, to speak about, um, and not just speak about, but to live um, the imperative of the, the inextricable involvement, uh, the inextricable link of the church and the world, uh, the life of the church and the life of our society. Um, so we're delighted you've come. Thank you. Um, how we'll play things is that Bishop Tim will talk for about half an hour, then we'll have questions uh, straight after the talk. Um, and then, if people wish to stay, we'll have um, a glass of wine, fruit juice, there's a heap of cake. Um, that will keep you here, even if you don't, won't it? <laughs> um, uh, and just to set, so you know, um, if you're sitting here already thinking, well, you know, that's the obvious question, but I can't possibly ask it, I would be right, wouldn't I? But um, you are most encouraged uh, to make any comment, um, however um, apparently inappropriate, to ask any question, however apparently embarrassing. Um, somebody's already said to me they wouldn't ask that question um, because they didn't want to embarrass me. Um, please, um, let's make it an, an interesting um, an interesting evening. Um, so be bold, um, as you're about to do in speaking to us. Thank you so much. So, Bishop Tim, the Queen of the Church and England, thank you. Um, Elder, thank you very much. Um, there are very few people who could uh, have persuaded me uh, 
but to try in 30 minutes to tackle a subject like this. Uh, so the fact that I'm here and even giving it my best shot is a tribute to the affection and admiration in which I hold your vicar. And she and I may not be on speaking terms in half an hour's time, but at the moment the relationship is warm and uh, affectionate. I feel a bit like, um, by the way, you can't do this talk without name dropping. So forgive me, it's bound to happen. Um, I, went, I went to hear um, in Parliament, uh, Barack Obama addressed both Houses of Parliament. He got a huge audience, and he got up there, and you could see he was genuinely nervous. He said, I've been told the last three people to address both Houses of Parliament from this dais were the Queen, the Pope, and Nelson Mandela. <laughs> he said, that's either the spot a rather bad joke, or it's setting the bar very high, <laughs> and I knew how, know how it feels tonight. So let's do our best and see where we get to. Um, Ellen has said that I chaired the bishops in the House of Lords, that's true, and a bit of what I'm going to say will relate to that, and a bit of what I'm going to say will relate to dealings I had with the palace and with the Queen as a result of that, but a bit of it We'll bring in some personal stories, but also some history. So that's what I'm hoping to get through in the next half hour. It's a ridiculous assignment, but let's see how we get on. So um, here is Her Majesty, as we've all seen her in the last two or three weeks, from the balcony of Buckingham Palace at the Platinum Jubilee. And we all have our personal feelings about her. It's mostly, in most of the population, admiration and respect and affection, uh, but there may be other feelings that you have. But tonight is not the night for talking about her personally very much, but more about the role that she has in our society, in our church, and in our constitution. Um, so that, as I shall try to explain, there's been a great deal of coverage over the Jubilee about the royal family. There's been um, uh, all the royal personal videos in that show, The Queen Unseen, going back 70 years of family videos, more than 70 years. There's been discussion about the people who carried her train, the page boys, the flower arrangers, the way the dresses were designed, all that stuff. Um, that's not my stuff. So if that's what you come to hear tonight, you're at the wrong talk, and I won't be the slightest bit embarrassed if you just quietly slip away. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about her personally, or about what she does every day when she gets up in the morning. I'm going to try and talk about the role that she has, and how that makes, in my opinion, a difference to the way our country functions, even though she has no personal power and also a difference to the way our church functions. We might even, when we've gone through this um, uh, merry-go-round, uh, end up in Seoul, asking what difference does it make here, in this church, and to your vicar, and the way you understand the parish. So, here's a grainy photograph, black and white, of uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, a man called Geoffrey Fisher, in 1953, in Westminster Abbey, placing the crown on the Queen's head, and he is um, supported by the bishop, the Archbishop of York, and as it happens, the Bishop of Bath and Wells at the time. Don't ask me precisely why those two, but the two senior clerics of the Church of England are there. So this is an image of the profound relationship between church and state. And what I'm going to try to explain is that in our constitution, the Queen occupies a place at the pinnacle of both those worlds. Uh, not everybody thinks that's a good idea. Not everybody thinks having a Queen is a good idea. I'm not really here to argue that one way or the other, but simply to describe it. So, when the Queen is crowned, what's gone on? to get her to that point. Well, all kinds of things, 18 months of preparation um, in Westminster Abbey. The Abbey was closed for six months. 
Uh, they built um, railway tracks up the aisle to get all the equipment in, to build all the terraces, all the uh, special arrangements, completely transformed the inside of that medieval building. But the important things that happened before the crowning were that the Queen makes three fundamental oaths, promises, and I'm just going to read them out to you. Will you to the utmost of your power maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you maintain and preserve inviolably the settlement of the Church of England? I'll try and explain what that is in a minute. And the doctrine, worship, discipline and government thereof as by law established in England. So, the Queen is crowned on the condition, not only that she professes the Christian faith herself, but that she will maintain and protect the legal arrangements by which the Church of England has a place in the English Constitution, and not just the Archbishops or Westminster Abbey, but every church of England, including so in Paris Church. And thirdly, will you preserve unto bishops and clergy of England and the churches committed to their charge all such rights and privileges as by law shall appertain to them? So, here's another picture of the coronation and here's one of the Queen holding uh, the scepter and the orb, symbols of power which she's given. She's made those promises, and before she is crowned, two other crucial things happen. And then I'll explain how they all link together. One is this one. She's presented with what is known as the sword of state. Now this may all seem very obscure and peculiar, but what's going on in a coronation service, just as what goes on in every piece of public ritual, is a language is being used the language of ritual. And this part of the language offers the Queen the symbol of the highest authority in the land, the sword of state. And what the Queen does with that at the coronation is place it on the altar of Westminster Abbey. So what is being said is that my authority as Queen and the authority of all the ministers of the crown that is the government, and the authority of all the bishops derives from God. So not just the church is part of this world of faith in God, but the way our state and government is ordered also within our constitution derives from the same authority. And that's why uh, government ministers are called the ministers of the crown. And the other thing that happens before the Queen is crowned is this, it's a, not a very perfect picture, but there's a canopy that's carried over the Queen's head and she is anointed. And I don't know whether you can remember, but in the Old Testament people are anointed who are set apart for some special role for God. And initially, that was for people who were prophets. But gradually, if you follow the story through the Old Testament, you reach the book of Samuel, you read, Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it over Saul's head. He kissed him and said, The Lord anoints you prince over his people Israel. So this anointing stands in that long, long story going back. 3,000 years into the history of the people of Israel where the kings were anointed because they were seen as set apart part by God for this task. Just in uh, a slight diversion, this guy is Richard III. He was discovered in a car park in Leicester when I was the bishop there. And that's the story of another talk I'll give some other time. <laughs> but Richard III... Uh, was, of course, um, believed to have been, and is believed to have been by many people, the person who 
arranged for the princes in the tower uh, to be executed in order that his path to the throne uh, should not be impeded. And I can remember when we, when we buried him in Leicester Cathedral, uh, the Radio 4 Today programme turned up to anchor their programme from Leicester. I was interviewed uh, but just by the casket which had all his bones in it. And uh, they said, Bishop, don't you feel embarrassed that uh, a child murderer is lying in a privileged position in your cathedral? And I said, well, he's lying by the font. Uh, he was baptised as a Christian, uh, not through any virtue of his own, but because uh, of the mercy of God, just as all of us were. And, by the way, he was anointed for the task of kingship by the whole nation. And so that was a very important thing to be able to say about Richard III, as indeed about all the kings of England, uh, certainly going back to the 11th century. They have been anointed for the task. And therefore, it's a, a position which is a position of holy calling under God. Well now, the question is, and with just a brief two minutes on history now, how did we get to the position in this country in which the head of state and the head of the church, those positions are occupied by the same person? And of course, the answer is, it's all down to this guy, Henry VIII, who was cross. Henry VIII was cross about quite a lot of things, but he was particularly cross that Catherine of Aragon failed to bear him uh, a male heir. Without a male heir, he couldn't be at all confident who would succeed him, whether the succession would be taken care of. Um, and uh, he couldn't divorce Catherine of Aragon because the Pope uh, was head of the church in England at the time and would not possibly have countenanced it. And to cut a very long story short, uh, it was Henry VIII who decided through, um, this incident is a picture of Martin Luther because ideas about moving away from the authority of the Pope were gaining ground right across Europe at the time. But what Henry VIII did was he published this document. I'm sure you can all read it and understand it from where you're sitting, but just in case you can't, um, I've no idea what it says, but it's the, something called the Act of Supremacy. So, in effect, what it said was, in 1534, the Pope is no longer the head of the Church in England. From now on, I declare that the King, or the Queen, is the head of the Church. And Henry VIII was probably the most autocratic monarch we've ever had. Uh, there was really no way of contesting this. The people of England were content with it. And since then, the position of the Pope in relation to the Church of England, in England, has been there is no position. And uh, there is, of course, there are many other churches in England, the Catholic Church, where he is the head, and many other uh, ch dissenting churches that subsequently broke away. But at the time, the role of the sovereign and the role of the head, supreme head of the church was located in the same office. Now what does all this mean today? Well, I can tell you, it has practical outworking for us, for me as a bishop. So that when I became the Bishop of Leicester, back in 1999, a couple of months after becoming bishop, I had to go to Buckingham Palace uh, in my best Episcopal robes and wait uh, at an appointed time in a, uh, a corridor outside the audience room where the Queen was seeing various people. And I had to sit there with the Home Secretary at the time. Uh, it was a man called Jack Straw. He'd been, he was Foreign Secretary as well during the Blair government. And the Queen was running late so we sat there for half an hour talking about all kinds of interesting things, and then went into uh, Her Majesty, bow, 
take three paces forward, bow again. And I was told that uh, there would be a, a, a large kneeler in front of Her Majesty, and that I was to kneel down, and I was to put my hands between her hands. And the Home Secretary would read out an oath that I was to give. Now, I need to tell you that this particular kneeler wasn't very secure. <laughs> it was on the edge of the carpet, and it was wobbling. And I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to kneel with my toes still on the ground, sort of slightly upright, or whether I was to kind of kneel right onto it. And I felt that at any moment I was going to pitch forward into the royal bosom. <laughs> so these moments of history are not always publicly recorded. <laughs> but I have to tell you, it's far and away the most important thing that happened to me that day, even though nobody got to hear about it. Now the, the question is, so what was, I, what was I saying when I was doing that? Well, I was trying desperately to repeat what the Home Secretary was saying, but I'll tell you what it was. I won't read all of it. I, having been elected, confirmed, and consecrated Bishop of Leicester, do hereby declare that your majesty is the only supreme governor of this your realm in spiritual and ecclesiastical things, and that no foreign prelate or potentate has any jurisdiction within this realm, and I do my homage presently to your majesty. So help me God. Now, can you see the connection between that oath and what I've just said about Henry VIII? Basically, I was saying, Your Majesty, I'm your bishop, not the Pope's bishop. And these are the words that have been said all down the centuries, ever since that act of supremacy was uh, passed in 1534. Now, you may say, well, that's all very interesting. What difference does any of this make to the price of a cup of tea in Seoul? Well, let's see if we can work that out. Um, because there's a little bit more to say about this. But what it does is it means, as I say, that you've got the ecclesiastical hierarchy, if you like, and the hierarchy of the state and government, both deriving their power from the same source, or their authority from the same source, not their power. And both requiring to make oaths to the sovereign in order to hold office. And this works out, uh, and so this is a picture of um, the present Archbishop of Canterbury on the day he did his homage, um, about um, 15 years after I did mine, because he's much younger. Uh, I've got to the age now where archbishops are much younger than me. <laughs> and I'm reaching the age where popes will be younger soon, but I haven't quite <laughs> got there yet, so there's still life in the old dog. Now then, here we are, uh, you all know this place, the Houses of Parliament. But, of course, what is the other title for this building? It is the Palace of Westminster. So we have a parliament that meets in the Queen's Palace. And for nearly 500 years, I mean, this building is, uh, is Victorian Gothic, but in the Middle Ages and all the way up to the 16th century, this was where the kings of England lived, not in this building, but on this site. And when um, Pugin built this, it was still called the Palace of Westminster. And what do palaces have in them? They have thrones. There is the throne in the Houses of Parliament. It's in the House of Lords. So when we met as Lords uh, in the House of Lords, we did so in front of an empty throne, which was a whopping big symbol of the fact that we are uh, ministers, whether we were bishops or secular, of the crown. The Queen, of course, occupies the throne when she uh, does the state opening of Parliament, although she didn't uh, manage it last time. I expect we shan't see her on that throne again. Apart from anything else, the steps going up to it are quite wobbly, and um, it would challenge many of us, particularly the 96-year-old lady. But the throne is there as a reminder of that. And the House of Lords gathers uh, in the, sitting around with the throne occupying 
one end of the building, and in the House of Lords there is a row, a, a seat, a row of seats here and here, where the bishops sit. Um, in the days before Pugin built this building, uh, that was where the fireplace was, and the bishops got to sit nearest to the fireplace, which was the best, easily the best place to be. There's no fireplace anymore, but it doesn't stop the bishops sometimes nodding off during the uh, debates. Um, so, this is something about uh, the House of Lords. It's, it's mostly made up, as you can see, of, of politicians, uh, but there are bishops there as well, the Lords Spiritual and the Lords Temporal. When the House of Lords was first created, there were more Lords Spiritual than there were Lords Temporal. Now, there are 26 Daas and bishops uh, who arrived there by seniority of their time in office in the House of Lords. Both the archbishops are there automatically. But all of them, uh, both uh, the bishops and the members of the House of Lords, have to take an oath. Here's the Archbishop of Canterbury taking his oath, uh, an oath of allegiance to the Queen. And I, for about uh, six or seven years, was asked to be the chair of the bishops in the House of Lords. So I used to chair meetings of the bishops. But interestingly, what I found was during the, about the last five years I was doing that job, the, this sounds terribly grand, but I'm not saying it to sound grand, the Queen's private secretary, a man called Christopher Geit, who's now um, supposed to be the ethical advisor to the Prime Minister, all that, um, uh, he, he used to ring me up and um, I'd say, come to lunch. So I, it sounds terribly grand. So I'd go to lunch at Buckingham Palace twice a year, and um, we'd have sparkling water and a little bit of salad. It wasn't a very exciting lunch, but it was a very, very interesting conversation because he, his job was to keep eyes and ears on what was going on in all kinds of places. And he was regularly talking to people and he wanted to know what was going on in the Church of England, what was going on in the House of Lords, what was going on amongst the Lords spiritual. So that point of connection between the palace, the church and parliament was very real. Um, for me during that time. I wasn't the only point of connection, of course I wasn't, but I was one of them, and it made it very interesting. The other thing to note, though, about Parliament is, of course, that every day when Parliament meets, prayers are said, uh, and Parliament does not conduct any business until prayers are over. It's not required for, by any member to be present when the prayers are read, but all members, whether they're Christian or not, are invited to be present. And this is the prayer said in the House of Lords, always by one of the bishops. Um, this is a slightly abbreviated version of it. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign, that's the connection between God's authority and the monarch, by whom alone kings reign, and from whom alone cometh all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, we do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, and grant that we, having thy fear always before our eyes, may lay aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections. Uh, I came to love that prayer, really, because um, it really is saying we're not here for ourselves. We're here to do the common good. Um, I wish it was more uh, understood and followed by many of our politicians today. Well, I'm going to move on fairly quickly, and uh, this is just a picture of St Paul's Cathedral on the day of the Platinum Jubilee, but I want to just say a word about how crown and church and country connect in other ways. And one of them is through this place, interestingly, which is um, Sandringham in Norfolk. Um, because, and here's the, the main um, a living room in Sandringham. Because part of the tradition in England is that one of the Darson bishops gets invited to Sandringham when the royal family is there after Christmas. So about 20 years ago um, it was my turn and I went and spent a weekend uh, with the household in Sandringham and then on the Sunday evening uh, dining with uh, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh alone. That's an immense privilege to be doing that. And, to be took, and 
What I discovered is that for the Queen, that felt to be a very real personal relationship, not with me as an individual, but with me as one of the bishops that she regards as her bishops. And she's quite clear about that, really, that bishops have, have sworn an oath of allegiance to her, uh, they pray for her, and they uh, do homage to her as queen. And she sees that as fundamental to her understanding of her role. Um, and uh, the other thing you do is preach in Sandringham Parish Church, which I did. Um, and interestingly, uh, after dinner, Prince Philip patted the sofa and said, to Bishop, get yourself a drink, come and sit down. And he wanted to have an argument about the sermon, which was fine. But that, that, uh, he'd listened very carefully to it, highly intelligent man, and he, he learns by tussling. Oh, indeed. Uh, and I, I found that a great privilege. The other, the other bit of the story is that um, at the Diamond Jubilee, uh, Lamb Palace, um, uh, uh, Buckingham Palace got in touch to say, um, we want the first of the Diamond Jubilee visits by Her Majesty, this is ten years ago, to be in Leicester. And we asked, well, what, why is that? Because we only had about eight weeks notice. And of course the answer was, well, because in 1952, what England looked like then is very, very different to what it looks like today. Today, the people of England are black and white and brown. They're from all over the world. We're a multi-racial, multi-cultural, multi-faith society. The Queen is the Queen of all of that. And we want images at the beginning of the Jubilee progress around the country that reflect uh, the diversity of England. And so as a result, the Queen came to Leicester and we uh, put something on for her in the cathedral and then we put on a lunch for her and all the people um, uh, who were in positions of leadership around the city and the county. This is a, a bad photograph with spoilers all over it, but it just shows uh, the Queen uh, was very attentive to everything going on around her, always asking questions. Uh, always genuinely interesting and completely without um, any kind of um, uh, affectation to her at all. Um, we arranged for Kate Middleton, as she was then, she wasn't uh, the Duchess of Cambridge in those days, to be escorted by this guy uh, who was a, a young uh, Muslim who we knew very well and had worked with a lot. And that absolutely touched the spot with the palace, that we've got a young a bright uh, person of a different faith to be on parade in the cathedral accompanying the royal party. And they were very clear that everything they wanted they could do would be to reach not just the Church of England, but into other faiths and other worlds as well. So Her Majesty met, um, this was a, one of the leading Hindus in the city, there's a Sikh there, this was a member of the Jewish community, a Muslim woman and many others. Here's a picture of her uh, that took her to a Sikh Gurdwara and she met a number of Sikh uh, leaders there. And uh, during that Diamond Jubilee year, she also went to Lambeth Palace uh, a, as a guest of the then Archbishop, Rome Williams. Uh, and uh, a whole bunch of people from many different worlds were there. And she made an important speech, and I just want to quote some words from it because it it was really important that she sees her role as head of state and head of the Church of England, established by law, not confining her role just to the Christian or Anglican communities in any way, but being seen and felt to be the queen of all faiths and people of no faith at all. And she said this, here at Lambeth Palace, we should remind ourselves of the significant position of the Church of England in our nation's life. The concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and, I believe, commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in the country. And I think she was exactly right to say that. When I lived and worked in Leicester, 
They had many, many people who were Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jews, Baha'is, Buddhists. Um, but quite often, on public occasions, uh, they told me, we all look to you as the bishop, not as the leader of our faith, but as the person who convenes the faiths in our city and our county. And that was really important to hear the Queen giving expression to that view. So that many years ago when the Iraq war broke out, I stood with the Lord Mayor of Leicester in Town Hall Square with two uh, leading imams praying silently for the people of Iraq as Baghdad was being bombed, saying Christians and Muslims stand together at a time like this. And the same when, in 2005, it's a while ago, but you may remember that awful bombing, of the 7-7 bombings of the tubes and the buses in London. Many people were killed. And again, we gathered the faith leaders in public, because the whole point of that, those attacks was to set communities, the idea was to set communities against each other and to start uh, revenge attacks. And we stood together and made it very clear that we would not allow any of this disruption to break or fracture relationships of trust and mutual respect between the faiths in our city. So that's just something about how the role of the Queen in our national life affected me as, as a bishop in the diocese and how it plays out more widely in Parliament. And finally, as a counter hall, what does it mean here? And what does it mean for the three people in this photograph? Um, I don't know, you'll know better than me. But this thing about the church by law established, we think of it as meaning um, bishops are in the House of Lords, bishops go to the palace, the Queen comes to see bishops, more things I've been showing you. You can call that high establishment, if you like, high establishment. Establishment that works at one level of the Constitution. But much, much more important, I think, is what I would call the earthed establishment of the Church of England. And by that I mean the way in which the Church of England understands its role of being a public institution there to build community, to build relationships, to build a sense of place and belonging to build a sense in which neighbours know each other, take responsibility for each other, to build up the common life. Because I would say that common life is all of it is a concern of the God who we believe in and who we worship. And the building up of that common life is the building up of the kingdom of God. Whether the people who come to the events believe in God or not, is not the point. And that's why I think being the vicar of a church like this, in the way that your vicar does it, is such a precious and significant role for the whole community, and why this earthed establishment of the Church of England is something very precious for England, and something which I hope in another hundred years time will still be something that the next generations of people sitting in these pews understand and cherish and see is a matter of priceless value. I'm going to stop, but I hope I haven't lost you completely and I'm going to hand back to Ellen. It's a misquote, um, it's quite an elegant. I told you he was good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can we kill that? Is that all right? So we're not blinded. Kill it. Yes, please do. Yeah, quite people out hand. Thank you so much. Um, so for those of you who've only just come in, um, we thought we'd have sort of questions discussion. Now it doesn't have to be a question. It could just be um, a comment. Um, now and then we'll go on to drinks and a bit of cake or running away. Um, after a while of that. Some, anybody want to kick us off? Yes, I Timothy, go for it. It was Timothy who said he didn't I've been looking forward, go I've for it. I've been looking forward to this question. Sure. I, I, I have warned you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't understand why the Archbishop of Canterbury made no fuss when Boris Johnson prorogued Parliament. 
because in that way he certainly, in my opinion, took away authority from the Queen. Uh, what, uh, well, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, well, it's not for me to criticise the Archbishop of Canterbury, and um, I don't know what he may have said in private, but I do personally believe, I'm not, I mean, I'm not here really to uh, express my personal opinions about politics, but I think uh, proroguing Parliament was a very serious challenge to our democratic process. And I think the Supreme Court, under Baroness Brenda Hale, who sent the Prime Minister and the government back to Parliament and said what you've done is illegal, was a very, very clear uh, judgment about the importance of our democracy. And that for a Prime Minister to unilaterally close down our principal democratic institution was a very, very serious a threat to our democracy. I believe that. Um, I can't speak for the Archbishop of Canterbury, but I'd, let me put it this way. I think the office of Archbishop of Canterbury is a, is a very ancient office in our nation's life, um, with, a, with a, a history of going back at least a thousand years. The authority of that office and the way that the voice of that office is used is of absolutely fundamental importance, not just to the church, but to our nation. Of course, any archbishop has to think and pray and consider very carefully what they say and when they say it. Uh, I haven't spoken to the Archbishop of Canterbury about this. I don't have any dealings with him now because I'm retired. But I believe that on almost any judgment of the seriousness of that moment and of the need for a moral voice to speak into that, uh, I would have taken the same view as you. Yes, uh, I would agree with everything you say, but I have to make this point, and it's really what concerns me more than religion. I didn't vote for Boris Johnson from the word go because of all the children he's got, he doesn't look after and they're not fathers. And right. <laughs> and the point being, and I, I admit I admit this, my, it was my nephew who got him off his first line charge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'd better move on from that, otherwise we might uh, we, we might end up colluding with each other rather than not. Um, let's let's see where else we need to go. will be very different in to reflect modern cultures uh, country. But not only that, I have no doubt that Queen is a devout, devout Christian. Um, I've got no evidence about Prince Charles, for instance. But on the other hand, I don't think he would make vows that were not true to himself. Um, so do you think that will be reflected? somewhere in the uh, next combination. Um, the, the answer to that is, I'm sure it will be, as I, I know that people have been working on that for, for, for several years, now, for at least 10 years. Um, of course, nobody knows when the next combination is going to happen, but what is clear is that it has to reflect much more accurately the multicultural nature of our society. When you when we see the old grey film of the coronation, what do we see? We see dukes and earls and all the aristocracy with their coronets, and they're all white males of a certain age, pale male and stale. <laughs> um, they all had to take tablets to, in case they had to go to the laboratory. <laughs> I won't go into any more detail, but um, that will change. We will see a very different kind of gathering, very different. I think we will see different language. There's a fundamental question, because at the, at the moment, 
uh, the coronation takes place in the context of a celebration of the Eucharist according to the rites of the Church of England. Now that's constitutionally a very deep-seated uh, requirement. How that can be done in a way that doesn't automatically exclude very large numbers of people is something that has been a great deal of and what I expect will happen is the coronation will effectively happen in two locations and in two parts. One in um, St. Stephen's Hall, in the Palace of Westminster, so the ancient medieval hall, a wonderful handmade room, which will be, if you like, a more secular gathering, a greater secular, but it will be a gathering of all the, all the communities of faith and culture. And then there will be, I imagine, I may be quite wrong, a procession into the abbey where the rites of the Church of England, the anointing and all that will take place and the crowd. But that I think is the way it's being thought about and who knows what it will actually work out in. But I can assure you that people on the much higher pay grade than me have been working on this for some time. Do keep asking questions. It means I can watch her and the rushing the family. <laughs> keep, her, keep her moving. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, I'm here as church warden of a small village church yes. on the other side of Ely. Uh -huh. um, I'm not here as the fact that I am that, even though I'm here or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I listen with great interest and entirely accept what you explained about the importance of the Church of England through that line of authority to the Queen, Archbishops, Bishops, clergy. How are we going to cope with that in a world in which in our villages we can no longer have clergy that most people recognise? Um. Sunday morning on the Gospel in St. John, um, which is uh, where Jesus says, um, the Spirit will lead you into all truth. And um, I tried to make a point of my sermon, but the way the Spirit communicates truth is not by cascading down through archbishops, bishops, <laughs> clergy, archdeacons, aerodines, um, and finally, you know, the, Poor benighted figures and then church wardens and all that. Although there is a kind of feeling in the pews that those people up there don't they kind of know what God's all about and we just wait to be told to tell them. That's the opposite of the way the Spirit communicates. So this structure of hierarchy and authority has its place in, in maintaining institutional order and an institutional life if it's working properly. But it does not have its place. If it's thought that the truth about God filters down through these endless layers, because what we believe is that God communicates His deepest truth directly into our hearts. Now that wasn't the question that you were asking: was how are we going to manage without enough clergy? Um, I, that would take. I need another half hour maybe to answer that question. All I would say is this: um, I think one of the myths around in the church at the moment is that we don't have enough of anything. We don't have enough vicars, we don't have enough money. Um, we may not have what we think we want, but has, is that because God has stopped providing for us? Or because perhaps we're not looking in the right place for the right thing? Uh, and that presumably will elicit for me the question, so where should we be looking and what is the right place and what are the right well, that, that's a whole other discussion. I completely understand that, it, particularly in our rural areas, the multiplication of parishes is leading to uh, some very, very severe pressure on clergy, on congregations, and on church wards. I completely understand that. And I think you're right to raise that question. I think it takes us into a whole
whole different thing about, um, about the future of the church here, which we embark on in 50 years here or more. I hope then I will invite you back to have a look at Well, I'd probably say some quite disagreeable things about some of what the Church of England is doing at the moment. But that's a, that's a, that's a different conversation. Sometimes it seems to me that this is beneficial. I mean, I welcome the intervention of David Cameron over the ordination of bishops, challenging General Sidon to think again. On the other hand, I deeply regret the way in which uh, statute law has made it impossible for the Church of England uh, to uh, do uh, same-sex marriages without the statute law being changed. So I just wondered if you might comment about the way in which the church is both challenged and sometimes frozen by the legislative procedures. I mean, these are such tantalizing questions. I could go on. What about that, Nigel? Is that um, the specific case you mentioned about gay marriages? And I know that's controversial, but you raised it. And I know about this because I was in the Lords and I was involved in some of the legislation at the time. What happened was that the church went to the government and said, if you pass legislation to uh, allow uh, the marriage of two people of the same gender, uh, you will be doing something that contravenes what the Book of Common Prayer and the Common Worship Prayer currently teaches about marriage. Because if you read the preface of the marriage service, it's clear that it's a creation ordinance that men and women take each other apart. And the argument was if, oh God, you change that almost overnight, uh, you put the established church, which has been teaching something very different for 400 years in an almost impossible position, because you'll be either requiring us to change overnight, and how are we going to engage 16,000 church councils and clergy and congregations and community? Because we don't change just by fiat, we change by consultation and debate. We can't do it that way. And also, if you change the law of England and require the established church, to conduct these marriages, uh, you will be putting the clergy in a position where they may be preceded against by uh, same-gender couples who want to get married in church, but the clergy cannot in conscience conduct their marriage. So what the Church of England said 10 years ago, maybe a wrong or maybe the answer, was right into the law that you're about to pass government, provision that the Church of England is excluded from this arrangement. Um, and that was the Church of England's argument, uh, mistakenly, mind you. But that was, because I was at the meeting, so that was the only secretary. I was, Theresa May was the Home Secretary, and I had to go and talk to her. Um, so it's not that the Church wants to do something and the government won't let it in that particular case. It was church asked the government to protect it from having to do something that uh, a Cameron government had decided to, to enact. Um, it more widely, I don't think, I'm not a lawyer, I, I don't think you can have a church established by law and then say, in all respects, that established church can do what it likes without reference to Parliament. Now, in matters of, in lots and lots of matters, the church can do what it likes because we have something called the General Synod. So we can 
It's the only legislative body outside Parliament that can pass laws, which are the laws of England, actually. Um, but I don't think it's easy to argue that the church should be able to behave like a disestablished church while having the benefits of establishment at the same time. That's, that's the short answer to the long term question. That makes sense. I don't think I'm content with that work. I'm actually a I'm actually a supporter of the establishment, and I also agree with your point uh, that if you are an established church, then uh, you do need to be accountable. In fact, one of I think one of the arguments of the polity of the Church of England is that God speaks to the church to the nation as well as for the nation through the church. So I'm I, I very much afraid of that. <clears throat> but I always wanted to tease out how it were. The, the difficulties that that position sometimes leads to. It absolutely does. And it means that people who have very little understanding of Christian faith, never mind the Church of England, and very little interest in it, <coughs> often regard themselves in part as having a voice into what the church decides to do or doesn't decide to do. But that's a consequence of precisely the point you've made, that the church needs to be a church that allows the, the secular world to influence it and sometimes determine the context in which it operates. And it's not a law entirely unto itself. I think that's what makes the church of England what it is. I mean, one key example of that is that when, when, until Gordon Brown was Prime Minister 10 years ago, uh, bishops were appointed by a commissioner of the church who recommended two names to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister then had the role of either sending the first name on to the Queen for appointment or sending the second name on to the Queen for or rejecting both names and saying, send me some other names. In other words, the Prime Minister couldn't choose, but he could make a choice between three options. Uh, Holden Brown, as the Presbyterian, uh, decided to um, um, discontinue that arrangement and got the law through Parliament. But the Prime Minister would only require one name from the church and would send it on to the Crown regardless. Because the Queen can only operate on advice from her First Minister. So, about 10 years ago, the idea that Number 10 had any voice in the choice of bishops stopped. Well, Mrs. Thatcher notoriously uh, influenced the appointment of bishops. And when I was made Bishop Dunwich, I got a letter from John Major, inviting me to be bishop, and saying, Would I please be consulted? I did it just. I would I please agree before the name went to the palace. And then I got a letter three years later when I became Bishop of Leicester from Tony Blair, uh, which had three typing errors in it. I've got it in a pile. One day I'll have it thrown in. Anyway, um, that's just by the way. But so the, those connections between government and church uh, are still there. But now it's only a vestigial. The name goes to number 10. And number 10 sends it. Pass. Actually, I didn't mean to make you run, I've got a microphone here, but you know. Um, on the kind of flip side of that, thinking about it the other way around, um, I've seen a lot on kind of Twitter and everything when the Archbishop of Canterbury preached very politically on Easter Day, and quite a lot of criticism about clergy speaking, kind of about state matters rather than church matters. And I remember sort of early in training, uh, various people saying, no, you know, don't talk about kind of politics and the state in the pulpit. That's, you absolutely can't do that. Um, but sort of, you know, hearing this talk and seeing how kind of intertwined that is, what do you think about that kind of criticism of the clergy talking about politics or indeed all else being told not to kind of thing? That's for me, that's a bit like um, tossing up a tennis ball just near the, just near the, uh, the net 
and giving me a racket to <laughs> slam it with on the other side. Um, what else is there to preach about except about how the gospel has meaning and relevance in the world? I mean, if it doesn't have any meaning and relevance, what, why, why are we preaching? Why don't we go and do something else? Um, uh, a wise uh, bishop once said, a preacher should have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And the point of the sermon is to, is, is to help people to see how this illuminates this. Because if it doesn't, well, neither do gather does. Now, on the particular example you mentioned, which was that Archbishop Justin raised the question of the deportation of um, asylum seekers to Rwanda. And to his credit, he put in the context of a sermon about the resurrection, about the new life, the new hope, and the restoration of, humanity, of all humanity under God. And then illustrated that by saying that if you then deport traumatized, vulnerable people to a completely foreign country uh, against their will with absolutely no power of appeal or restoration. You're flying precisely in the face of what the Bible tells us to do, which is the whole mission of the people of Israel was in the name of God to provide for the widow, the orphan, the vulnerable, the alien, and so he put, made a direct parallel between uh, the legislation on Rwanda and the way it contravened the gospel. So uh, I have, have to say that I would absolutely defend his right to do that, and not only defend his right to do it, but to say that you know, the Archbishop isn't doing that. He's not appropriately occupying the office of Archbishop. Um, and I think by, you know, by extension, the same is true for all of us who are ministers of the gospel. Um, if, if there are some things that are too <coughs> difficult to, to mention, or we, it doesn't mean that we simply declaim our politics from the pulpit every Sunday. I'm not saying that. Of course I'm not. But in every age of the Christian church, the gospel has had to be proclaimed often, and nearly always actually, in very unpromising circumstances. The early church under imperial Rome, Christians in many parts of the world today. Think of some of the great figures of the last century, Archbishop Jason Tutu, or Martin Luther King in the United States, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi occupied Germany. I mean, the great figures are the ones who said, my security and my reputation matters less than the proclamation of the gospel. And of course, um, you know, we follow in the way of Jesus Christ who lost his life for that. So I, I absolutely, I'm, I'm not saying I agree with everything that Archbishop Justin says or does, I don't, but I think his right and responsibility to sometimes speak truth to power on behalf of the gospel is that you're absolutely fine with it. Okay. Okay, not too long. Any more? The cake beckons. The cake beckons. The cake beckons. I want to see that. Put yourself on. Put yourself on. Um, <laughs> we've got something for you. In fact, we've got a number of things for you. Um, one of, um, I might have known that I could embarrass. No, 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 you are. Well, well you're, going to be, you're not going to be embarrassed. You're going to be reminded of um, the thing that I love. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, one of the wonderful things um, about you is that you have not lost touch with whatever you called it, um, you know, us on the ground and the life um, of the parish um, and not got detached in some stratosphere. Um, that's a platinum jubilee stone bash. Um, that's a jar of marmalade, uh, married, uh, married by, isn't that? Uh, 
made by Margaret Fisher, who's the wife of the current Geoffrey Fisher, um, who is at least up there in parallel with the Archbishop, who was uh, crowning the Queen. At least. At least up there, exactly. Geoffrey got his own, um, not Jeff, but his own medal last Sunday. Um, it, now, hang on a minute, exactly, that was Jeff Fisher. Now, where is Joy? Now, Joy, we commissioned something for you as well. Um, you'll like this. Joy at Easter, Joy at Easter made um, some little uh, people who were admitted uh, covering cream eggs. And I thought of you and asked for one for you. Um, and here it is, and you have to show it to everybody. But be careful, it was cross. Yes, it looks very, very precious. Get in the right way up. Can we see? <laughs> <laughs> I've been wiggling. Oh, right, you've been wiggling. Here's my lovely, um, oh, there we are. Here's my lovely little bishopy person <laughs> with a purple hat and a pectoral cross, and it, it's about to give birth to an egg, <laughs> which I've never managed to do. But, uh, <laughs> well,